Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday, January 27, 2016. I'm Corey Stolzenbach, joined by a wonderful guest right now. Had a very decorated career in the majors. 316 home runs, six-time All-Star. He's a four-time National League champ. And was a 1981 World Series champion. He was co-MVP with Steve Yeager and Pedro Guerrero. He played most of his career with the Dodgers, but he also was partly a Cub and partly an athletic. And also on June 23, 1973, Game 2 of a doubleheader and a 5-1 win against the Cincinnati Reds. That was the first will become baseball's longest running infield. 21 All-Star appearances combined between them. Steve Garvey played at first base. Davey Lopes at second. Bill Russell at shortstop. And this man, my guest, the Penguin, Ron Say, over at third base. And Ron, certainly there was no way to know that you guys would start something special back then. But when did it first pop into your head before you guys had something going? Uh, well, we grew up in the system. We were all uh, born and raised in the uh, Dodger organization, so we were under the tutelage of Tom Lasorda and Monty Baskell, who was our infield instructor that uh, pretty much put uh, Davey Lopes and uh, Billy Russell at shortstop and second base uh, uh, and started that uh, longest-running infield uh, in Major League history. So uh, we, uh, we had won throughout our minor league careers there. We had individual success, so... It was just a matter of whether this was going to translate into uh, being as successful at the major league level as it was in the minor league level. And sure enough, it was. And Walter Allstein and Al Campanas kept you guys for a very long time. You guys would be there up until the 1981 World Series championship. So how would you describe the chemistry before you guys had? I know you guys had a very close bond, like you said. Well, you know, obviously, as you well know, the, the game has changed today. And uh, the, the, the farm st- system doesn't uh, 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 have an opportunity, really, to uh, provide the number of players like it used to because you could take some time and nurture them. Uh, today, kids are rushed. Uh, they try to get them there as fast as possible. But uh, we grew up uh, in a system that uh, uh, was was designed for success, and uh, we got to know each other very well. We played instructional league baseball with each other. We played through the minor leagues. We played winter ball as well. Uh, Tom was sort of once again was uh, the person who recognized all these players and their talents and their skills and honed all of those things. And uh, You know, he was rewarded uh, as we were rewarded uh, when we uh, graduated to the major leagues. Things could have been very different, though, because you were selected at, out of high school uh, in the 19th round in 1966 by the Mets, and you chose not to sign and went to Washington State instead. This might seem like an obvious question, but I'm guessing you didn't sign the contract with the Mets because they didn't offer you a lot of money. Is that correct? Uh, actually, it was twofold. Uh, actually, maybe even more than that. Uh, number one... Uh, uh, I felt that uh, I really needed to uh, be away from home and uh, and try to get my uh, feet underneath me. Uh, you know, leaving home for the first time, going off to school. Uh, I, I felt that uh, it was important for me to uh, be able to go on and get uh, more education at that point. And I wasn't so sure that I really wanted to tackle my. Uh, my lifelong dream of becoming a major league baseball player at that time, and also we had the Vietnam War staring at the face, so we we needed to be protected uh, by the uh, by being enrolled in school, and so there was a lot of things involved in my decision. And uh, the next opportunity for me to sign would have been uh, after my sophomore year, and uh, that came about, and uh, I was selected by the Dodgers. Yes, you had a great career at Washington State. You didn't play on the uh, varsity squad in your freshman year, but it was Bobo Brayton, your college head coach, who gave the nickname the Penguin. And unfortunately, he passed away in last year. When was the last time you two had talked to each other? Uh, probably about a year, year and a half ago. Um, uh, going back to the beginning of this, uh, he was probably the one, one real... Uh, obvious reason that I selected uh, Washington State. You know, we didn't have freshman eligibility back then in the Pac-8. Uh, you had to play all freshman sports, and that's the time that, if you remember, uh, Lou Alcindor and the freshman uh, team at UCLA beat the varsity in a uh, in a in a scrimmage, uh, and they were the defending national champions. So. 
they, they couldn't hardly wait for that freshman eligibility to get over with back then. But uh, uh, the, the, the draft laws were different. The uh, mandatory number of games for college baseball has changed since then. We only played 38 games when I was a sophomore, and uh, we had a hard time getting a lot of games in. But uh, uh, it was a great experience for me. I, I, uh, I felt I made the right decision, and long term it worked out. Yes, it sure did. Uh, what did you say to Bobo last time you two had talked? Uh, we we talked about a lot of things. You know, I was just catching up with him most of the time. You know, he uh, always appreciated the fact that I would uh, stay in touch with him, and uh, uh, you know, he he and I had a, a terrific relationship. And uh, he he tried to talk me out of my signing my my sophomore year. He said, "Give me one more year. Give me one more year. You know, I think I can." Uh, own you into being a better player in one more year, but my uh, my mind was made up, and uh, it was the right timing for it. And uh, uh, he was he was an ambassador. He was much like uh, Rod Dato was for USC. That Washington State team in 1968 won 29-9. What do you attribute to having such a great sophomore season there, not only uh, individually but team wise as well? Well, I think we had seven guys that uh, that signed and, and played professionally. There was one other player, uh, his name was Rick Austin, that I uh, grew up with in Tacoma, Washington, with, was our left-handed starting pitcher. He was an All-American that year, and uh, uh, we played for a, uh, a semi-pro team in the summer uh, after my high school, my senior year in high school and my freshman year in uh, college called the Cheney Stud. And we went to... Uh, Back-to-back uh, World Series appearances in Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, with the uh, AABC bracket of uh, semi-professional baseball, and a lot of those players that, that were on that Washington team were on that uh, Cheney Stead team as well. And I know that Stanford was ranked number one that year. Uh, they were the number one team in the nation, and you hit a game-winning home run against them. Take me back to that. That was a one-game series. Uh, what were the details of that home run? I'd like to know what your plan was, the pitch, etc. Well, actually, that was a very important series for us and and, and me individually. Uh, it was our first uh, uh, California swing through the conference, and uh, we started out in Berkeley and uh, we went over to Stanford next day when Stanford was ranked number one, and we were facing a uh, pitcher uh, who uh, would become an All-American. His name was Sandy Vance, and actually he was the number two uh, selection of the Dodgers uh, in the uh, 68 draft in the secondary phase. And uh, we faced him, and uh, Bob Boone was the third baseman. Mark Mark was the coach that's been there forever, was the first baseman. He was an All-American. And we had another guy in the outfield, uh, uh, Bob Gallagher, who actually signed with the Dodgers in 68 as well. So they had a talent-laden team. But uh, we had a tie game in the top of the ninth, and uh, I was facing a relief pitcher, and I hit a home run to uh, put his head, and it, it stood up to be the game-winning home run. So... Uh, that was uh, that was a big start for us, and then our swing down to uh, Southern California included UCLA and USC, and uh, we had a, a good series there too. But uh, USC uh, was ranked number two, I believe, at the time, and they were the ones that that went forward out of our conference uh, because only we didn't play regional games, and uh, USC ended up winning the uh, national championship under the tutelage of Rod Dato. Where do you see you guys going uh, that season if you guys do beat USC? If you guys beat them, where do you see yourselves going? Uh, we, we, we felt that, uh, you know, we had to win the conference. I mean, there was we didn't have regional tournaments back then, so we, we had to... Uh, we had to beat all those people, and uh, what we had a good indication of how good we were because that Cheney Stud team that I told you on amateur level... Uh, we went up to Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, the summer of my senior year in high school, and we played the Fairbanks uh, Gold Panners, and they went to the NBC bracket of uh, national of the uh, semi-pro baseball, and and they had uh, Mike Adamson, Bill Lee, Jim Barr, Bob Boone, uh, to mention a few. So we we had a rubber match game that they had won uh, the final game of that series up there for a week, and. Uh, we knew we were in great shape, and they knew that they had a terrific club because they were drawing Stanford, USC, and UCLA. 
all the powerhouses uh, in California in the in the Pac-8 conference. So if we played them that well, we were playing going to play pretty much that well well as well. You'd be selected by the Dodgers in the third round of '68. What do you remember upon hearing that you were drafted both out of high school by the Mets and by the Dodgers in '68 out of Washington State? Well, I was just uh, you know thrilled to to you know get the opportunity. It's kind of the way that I had hoped it would play out, and uh, I was going to an organization then that uh, was uh, playing extremely well, and uh, and and. Uh, their tradition and history was great, so I felt I was going to an organization that was about winning, and it was, and uh, it was right up my alley. Your debut comes September of 71 against Cincinnati. Joe Gibbons on the mound. You guys won 6 5 after being down 5 2. You struck out while pinching for Jose Pena, but I'd like you to walk me through the whole process of what's going through your mind from getting the call to going to the game to coming out for the first time as a major leaguer and stepping into the Bears box at Dodger Stadium for the first time. Well, I got the uh, news from Tom Lasorda. He had uh, asked me to go to lunch, and uh, this was while we were at home finishing up the last few days of the season kind of odd because uh, usually he'd say let's go to lunch on the road at home it was a little different so I, I just had a huge year in Spokane and you know I was hoping for the best but I really uh, didn't uh, put the two together at the time but uh, once we got into uh, conversation over lunch uh, I uh, <laughs> he said in a couple of days you're going to be uh you're going to be going to Dodger Stadium, and uh, they're calling you up. And uh, there were only two other players called up, uh, Mike Strawler and uh, Shork. And uh, another very important uh, event in my life was happening a week later, uh, and I was getting married uh, in Chicago. And so uh, with an eight-day span, uh, I was having the two most significant things in my life happen. So uh, it was a big thrill on all levels. And uh, going back to my first pinch hit, uh, I was so nervous that uh, uh, I still remember the fact that I was that nervous. But uh, it was an opportunity for me to at least get started in my career there. I got to watch the Dodgers go through a pennant race in the month of September, and all I had two pinch hitting uh, uh, appearances that uh, that that call up in September and uh, I remember Walter Alston uh, who was our manager uh, saying to me after I struck out, he said, kid, I struck out my first at bat too, so don't worry about it. So from that point, uh, you know, I uh, was able to uh, put together a, a career with, uh, with two Hall of Fame managers and Alston and Lasorda, so we were in good hands. I know you spent most of 72 also on the farm, AAA Albuquerque. So who do you credit the most um, for helping you make that giant step from being a very good prospect to permanent play in the hot corner of Chavez Ravine? Uh, you know, I, I think they all deserve a little bit of credit. You know, I mean, we, uh, uh, Monty Basco certainly, certainly uh, as well as Tom Lasorda, you know, hit me as well as everybody else, countless number of ground balls, but... Uh, I had had a lot of success. Uh, I was an all-star at every level. We won at every level um, of minor league baseball and instructional league and winter ball. Um, so when we got to the major leagues, we were uh, uh, we were ready to go, and we were confident that we could uh, make this translate to winning in the big leagues. And the good news about 1973, you guys go 95 and 66. You would end the season with a five-game winning streak, but you guys also had a nine-game losing streak in September when you played the Astros, Giants, and Padres, and also lost four out of five to the NL West champion Reds. Where do you think it went wrong for you guys that month of September of 73? Uh, I just think that, uh, you know, Cincinnati was uh, the best team in our division and uh, uh, possibly the best team in baseball, uh, although they did not win the World Series that year. Um, but uh, they had a, a veteran-laden team and uh, certainly more experienced than our uh, rookie season players. Uh, but uh, I remember Walter Alston uh, at the end of the season uh, saying that, uh, I don't want you guys to feel uh, bad about this uh, at all, the fact that we lost. 
the guys won 95 games. Normally, that's good enough to win, and uh, you're playing against a great Cincinnati team. And he was uh, positive and, and uh, confident that uh, we would uh, return and do this again. And the next year, we uh, turned around and uh, fought them off down the wire and uh, won 102 games and beat the Pirates in the playoffs and lost to uh, the Oakland A's in the 74 World Series. Sure, indeed, but there's a long process, 162 games, and so after that 73 season, uh, you guys will replace Jim Brewer at close with uh, Dr. Mike Marshall. You got him from Montreal for Willie Davis, and Marshall won the Cy Young, and especially in the second half, he was just lights out. He was a real workhorse. How else besides the upgrade at close do you think you guys improved in 74? Well, we got Jimmy Wynn to play center field. Uh, Jimmy came in and... Uh, I think uh, had a hundred walks, hundred runs batted in, hit thirty home runs, uh, was an all-star uh, center fielder, um, gave us leadership, uh, hit third in the lineup. Um, that was a uh, huge offensive uh, improvement uh, to uh, our club overall, and uh, we had three guys close to driving in a hundred runs, so we had a. A well-oiled uh, offensive machine going on right then, and uh, uh, and of course our pitching had always been uh, our strength, and uh, they certainly uh, pitched well in uh, in '74 as well. '74 was also the first of six straight All-Star appearances for you, and you were credited with two RBIs, a double off of Gaylord Perry that drove in Steve Garvey. What did the honor mean to you to not only be an All-Star for the first time, but the fact that you were the NL starting third baseman that year? Uh, huge thrill. Um, uh, a lot of support from you know, our fan base to elect me as the uh, starter. Um, uh, we we had a young club, and uh, they they certainly uh, took to us as well. Uh, they understood that uh, uh, that we were going to be uh, here for for at least quite some time. over the years were pretty much uh, who wins the National League West goes to the World Series and I believe Cincinnati and the Dodgers uh, probably I, I think eight of the ten years that uh, reigned to be true. You talked about the NLCS against the Pirates and in game two you took Jim Rooker deep. It was a 1-0 count in Three Birds Stadium. Would you mind please um, describing or tell me about that home run what you remember from it? Uh, I just remembered that, you know, I'd had a horrible day the day before and uh, uh, made, uh, uh, I, I went over three, uh, was not feeling well, uh, did not feel comfortable. Uh, defensively, I did not play well. Uh, I, I made my first and only two errors in, in, in uh, playoff history, the first game, and so I was trying to dig deep and, and uh, find myself for the uh, for the next game and uh, was able to respond with uh, with four hits, two doubles, a home run off Jim Rucker, and it was a ball that I hit uh, down the left field line off the uh, foul pole, but it uh, gave us a little more insurance. Uh, Pirates were an outstanding team, and uh, we had our work cut out for them us opening the first two games back in Pittsburgh. And you took those first two games, but then the series moves to Dodger Stadium, and the Pirates win 7 nothing in Game 3, and then you guys win Game 4 12-1. But I want to know everything that happened in between the final out of Game 3 until the start of Game 4. What did you guys say to each other? What was your approach of bouncing back? And what were you guys able to do to not only redeem yourselves from the previous game, but also on such a decisive merit to win the pennant 12-1? Uh, I, I didn't take it any more as a, a one-game loss. We're ahead two games to one. We're going back to Dodger Stadium. Uh, we're playing in front of our fans. Uh, we're, we're, we're comfortable. And uh, the next game, we uh, rebounded and uh, won in a route. Yes, you sure did, and even though the A's won that World Series, like you mentioned, it was a third World Series championship in a row. They have won in 72 and 73 also, but you guys played them very tough for a five-game series because four of those five games were decided by one run, 
And when you're facing a team that won the previous two World Series, how much do you think of it was an experience factor that played to tipping the scales in their favor, given how they've been there before? Um, obviously, uh, you have to take all that into consideration. You know, they were a team that was uh, the reigning world champions, and uh, they were going for three in a row, and uh, we played them tough, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, a lot of one-run games, but uh, uh, you know, they came out ahead. And uh, once again, uh, you know, we felt that uh, based on the fact that uh, we had won 102 games, we beat the Pirates in the playoffs three games to one and uh, uh, played, I think, formidably, regardless of the fact that we won, uh, lost four games to one, uh, gave us, I think, a lot of confidence uh, in the uh, in the long run as far as uh, having a team that was going to be able to play uh, that kind of baseball. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I was disappointed to lose. It's always disappointing to lose, and especially in the World Series. But uh, I don't think that it uh, uh, really took a lot of our confidence away at all. It uh, simply uh, let us know that uh, we had a few more things that we had to uh, to do before we were going to be world champions. And 75 the next year was known for a lot of things, but especially for the Dodgers, because one of your own teammates, Andy Messersmith, he was known for playing without a contract that season. Let's talk about that situation and what it was like for you to be around him as well as what you thought would happen to settle this dispute. Well, uh, you know, nobody nobody knew what was going to happen, you know, and it t- turned out to be a, a, a huge uh, uh, decision that was made and uh, opened up the door for uh, free agency and arbitration, uh, which changed the game, and it's... Uh, continuing to change uh, as we see it today. Yes, there was a size decision that ruled that uh, players can become free agents, but Marvin Miller also negotiated. There was a compromise of the owners saying that players must have six years of service before hitting the market. But as we know, though, Ron, the labor negotiations, collective bargaining far from over, there would be the strike in 1981, there was collusion with Peter Uberoth, and also the strike shortened season of 1994, so definitely some tough times for baseball ahead from a collective bargaining standpoint. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. There's obviously uh, issues. Uh, nobody likes to have to have those kind of... Uh problems escalate to a strike. Uh, you see it in everyday life as well, and uh, it becomes uncomfortable for the people that uh, it affects and uh, people on the outside as well. And how do you feel about Marvin Miller? Should he be in the Hall of Fame? Uh, Marvin was the uh, person who uh, changed uh, the scope of uh, the relationships between uh, Major League Baseball and the Players Association. Uh, he was a he was a great person to have in charge of that. Uh, he was extremely knowledgeable, uh, a smart negotiator. And as far as having somebody like that voted into the Hall of Fame, I, I don't know where he would fit. Uh, we have players, coaches, managers, etc., broadcasters. Uh, if the uh, committee uh, deems him to be uh, uh, eligible for the Hall of Fame, then I would think that he would probably get a lot of consideration. Well, he fell one vote shy uh, in 2010 for the class of 2011 that elected Pat Gillick, so he's been close before, but he hasn't exactly cracked the 75% yet. Well, that's true. Uh, I, 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 uh, I don't vote, so I, I really couldn't tell you. The, I am surprised by the voting of the Hall of Famers anyway, as far as who they what the prerequisites for that are. Uh, I don't I don't know of anybody who can really uh, give me a, a, a set of prerequisites and, and have everybody uh, understand them and abide by them. And going off the size decision, uh, with that, along with Bui Kuhn, Bui Kuhn vetoing the trade of Vita Blue to the Reds, is it fair to say uh, that played a, a big part or a small part at all, you guys winning back-to-back pennants in 77 and 78? Um, not exactly sure. Uh, I know that the Reds uh, didn't have the same players that we came in. They were kind of dismantling their club. Um, you know, the, I think Johnny Bench uh, probably retired a little bit early as far as, uh, as uh, 
he might be concerned or they might be concerned. So the face of the Reds was changing, uh, obviously, and uh, they had picked up Tom Seaver um, uh, from the Mets to bolster their staff at, uh, at, at one point. But uh, I don't remember a great deal about the Vita Blue issue. Okay, very well then. Let's move on to 1977. This is Game 3 of the NLCS. And it's known as Black Friday in Philadelphia. It's a veteran stadium. You guys win a wild one. Uh, but there was a lot of controversy for different reasons. Harry Wendell studies umpiring home plate. And he's calling balls on Bird Hooten when he's facing Larry Christensen, his counterpart. But some people were thinking, even Harry Callis was saying, those might be strikes. And Wendell said was calling them balls. What was going through your mind? What were you seeing when you saw Hooten uh, doing to Christensen that at bat? Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, I, I'm uh, not surprised that Bert was uh, uh, going off his rocker. Uh, if you were to look at the uh, the replay of the uh, strike zone uh, that Harry Windelstadt was uh, using that day, you uh, you would have had trouble with it as well. Uh, I think Bert stayed as composed as he could, but uh, obviously. Harry had a real bad day behind the plate, and uh, it changed the whole complexion of the game. And uh, uh, it was probably the worst umpired game I've ever seen in my life. It's a pretty big statement for sure. And uh, definitely some controversy for both the Dodgers and the Phillies because he made some questionable calls that favored you guys too. So, I mean, you say it was the worst you'd ever seen. And um, a lot has changed. Uh, in the game since then, obviously, you have expanded replay, there's challenging and whatnot. Um, but speaking of Larry Christensen, you hit very well against him, and you had three home runs against him in 1977 alone. Why do you think you did so well? Uh, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. I think there's just certain styles of pitching that... Uh, that uh, is is more in your wheelhouse, and obviously that year he was in my wheelhouse. And there are other pitchers that uh, uh, I don't have that same kind of success uh, uh, with, and I probably uh, feel as comfortable and confident uh, the same way. So uh, that that's hard to tell. Uh, I, I had some good at bats. Uh, he hit my bat a number of times. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in the eighth inning, Bob Boone hit a grounder to you, and you threw it pretty high and away from Steve Garvey. That allowed Gary Maddox to score. But looking at the replay and watching that game, looked like you had time. I don't know if it was the grip or the bounce when you threw that ball away, but explain what happened there on that throw. Uh, I don't. I, I don't recall the play. You don't? Well, it's a very uh, famous play, but if you don't, then that's probably fine. But you threw... Uh, you threw the ball away. Gary Maddox hit it to you. Uh, you looked like you had time, um, but it might have been something wrong. But you threw it away, allowing the score. But um, to end that inning, though, you nailed Bake McBride on a closer play, barehanded. It was a one-hop hit to you, and it was a five-three on a sidearm throw. So you did redeem yourself. But the ninth inning of that game was just completely crazy. How it unfolded It's five to three. Gene Garber retires the first two Dodgers, as you probably know. Then Vic Davileo, he pinch hits for a drag bunt single. Manny Mota, he pinch hits with a double and error, bringing him to third. Davileo scores. Um, Mota could have been out, but Luzinski trapped it at left field wall. Then there's the really controversial play with Davey. He had that grounder off of Mike Schmidt, and Larry Boa threw it to Richie Hebner at first, and then Mota scored, and Lopes was called safe. Danny Ozark comes out, and he's furious to argue, and while I'm looking at the replay, it could have been by a half a step, but I don't know, because today, going back to the instant replay, it has to be conclusive evidence. I'm not so sure if it's conclusive or not, but what do you think in that last at-bat? Do you think he was safer out in your view? Uh, well, I don't I don't have, obviously, the, the replay in front of me, and uh, uh, they felt he was out, and we felt he was safe, and that's how it was ruled. Uh, he was ruled safe. So without seeing the instant replay, of which I do believe is, uh, is necessary uh, to determine those plays, uh, it's impossible for me to have. Very well then. As you know, Lopes will get in a scoring position. The ball is thrown away. Russell will be at the play, and he would single home the shallow center for the go-ahead and winning run. And you guys would end up winning your second pennant. 
It was the second in four seasons. And how was this 77 team different from 1974? Uh, we were three years older. We were better players. Uh, the 77 team had the first 30 home run for us in Major League history. Um, so we were a better team. Certainly, but unfortunately for you guys, another defeat. Six games to the Yankees this time. You outscored them 28-26, and you hit a home run yourself in Game 2. But one of the greatest World Series performances ever, Reggie Jackson, three home runs in Game 6. He was the only second player in Fall Classic history at the Brave Ruth to hit three homers in a World Series game. And he has since been joined by Eller Pujols and Pablo Sandoval. What would you like to say on Mr. Arturo's performance that evening in Game 6? On Reggie's performance? Yes, what would you like to say about that? It was a great performance. He hit uh, home runs off three different pitchers. And we uh, were uh, one game behind in the series, uh, had a chance to tie it up, and we ran into a guy that had an incredible game. And 78 would be deja vu all over again. Uh, game four of the NLCS against the Phillies. It was very memorable for you. You had a game-tying two-run shot. Uh, to left off of Randy Lurch. Then the bottom of the 10th, deadlock at 3, 2 outs. You draw a walk to get the rally going. Tell me your approach to facing Tom McGraw since some of those pitches were close. I know it could have been borderline, but you're facing McGraw on the bottom of the 10th in Game 4 of the 78 NLCS. Uh, what was your approach in that at-bat to facing him? Uh, I didn't think he was going to give in and allow me a chance to hit a home run. And... Uh... So we got things started, and uh, we got a break when uh, Maddox dropped a, a liner by Dusty Baker and set up the opportunity for Bill Russell to uh, get the game-winning RBI. Yes, he did. Uh, he singled, and then Maddox came charging in. He misplayed it and then sealed it. And shows you how someone great defensively like Gary Maddox can mess up, a guy who won eight gold gloves in his career. What, what, what thoughts were racing through your head as you were hustling home to walk off and win the pennant? What thoughts were racing through your mind at that point? Well, we're going to win the game and move on to the World Series. But something must have been very exciting knowing that you yourself were at the center of all of it. The fact that you scored that winning run, you're hustling, you're coming home, and the helmet is flying off your head. You must have been very excited for that, though. Uh, yeah, I was just happy that uh, you know we uh, had, I was able to score the run and we were able to uh, win the game. And the pennant, for sure. And your confidence level, what was it like? Where was your confidence level at after you guys went up 2 nothing, had to Yankee Stadium in that series? Uh, that we had, uh, you know, come back again and uh, put ourselves in an opportunity that was going to get us into the World Series, and uh, it did. But I'm sure you must have found, felt really confident, though, because you guys were halfway there and you're up 2 nothing in that series, though. Yeah, we were, we felt, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was a great series to get started uh, and, and, uh, and, and get a two-game lead before we had to go back to Yankee Stadium. And Yankee Stadium, that's where the turning point in the series was, Ron, because Lou Pinella... Bottom of the six, game four, he would hit a ball to Russell, who knocked it down. He stepped on second. Reggie Jackson went nowhere because he was in between first and second base, and it was thrown away from Garvey. Thurman Munson would score on that May 3 to 2, and eventually the Yankees would win that game and the series. Who do you blame for the fiasco that transpired in that game, that at bat, the bottom of the fourth, uh, excuse me, the bottom of the sixth in game four? Who do you blame for all that?
or if the umpires had uh, used better judgment in allowing Frank to make the call, I'm pretty sure that the, the right call would have been made, and we would have walked into the dugout with a 3 nothing lead, and uh, it changed the complexion of the whole World Series. That was play. Well, there was also been speculation on that play if Russell dropped that ball accidentally or he did it intentionally. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think he dropped it intentionally because actually uh, the runner at second base was probably three feet from him when he dropped it. And he decided to uh, step on second base and throw to first rather than uh, get in a rundown. It was an easy play to make except for Reggie's hip. So the play uh, went awry and the Yankees benefited by a missed call. Do you guys win that World Series without everything happening in Game 4 taking place the way that it did? I believe if you understand the circumstance of that, they, that game was, I believe, tied with two outs in the bottom of the eighth, and it went extra innings. I think it went 12 innings. So it means that uh, we are the ones going back to the hotel at 3 in the morning, not feeling real great about this. The series would have been 3-1 to one rather than 2-2, two, two, and we played, I think, a 12 o'clock game the next day. So we didn't really have an opportunity to get this out of our system, or at least I didn't, and I'm sure others as well. Uh, so, yeah, uh, maybe if we had had a night game, it may have given us an opportunity to get this out of our system. But before you knew it, we were back out there, um, not having gotten over the night before. And if I'm sure the score would have been three games to one. It may have been the Yankees who kind of didn't have their – this out of their system, and uh, that that could have been an, uh, an important game as well. It could have ended the series there in our favor. So there's lots of speculation being made on it. We've talked it over. It's the most difficult uh, loss uh, in postseason in my career, and uh, it's, it's the way it went. I think they may have won that in the bottom of the 10th. So out of those three World Series defeats, you think that 78 was the toughest to take then? 78? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, just uh, making sure. So 1980, two years later, it's a three-horse race between uh, you guys, the Reds, the Astros. I know September wasn't easy on the Dodgers. Davey was hurt. Rick Monday was hurt. And so are you because of your right hamstring. First things first, I want to know, what was rehab like for you trying to get better while in the midst of a tight playoff race during that 1980 season? 1980? Yes. Uh, you had that right hamstring, and uh, you had a right hamstring. You're trying to recover. You were hurt. Um, remember, uh, you, the Dodgers, uh, the Reds, the Astros, the three of you guys were trying to win the West? And is this where it went to the one-game one game playoff in 1980? Yes, it is. Okay, well, I don't remember having a hamstring problem, um, but I had uh, um, I had groin issues, and uh, we had a three-game series at Dodger Stadium where, where we were three out with three to go, and uh, we were able to uh, win three in a row, and uh, I couldn't play in the uh, one-game playoff because I had a ball down on my foot uh, in my last at-bat where I homered. Uh, and so uh, we went out the next day with uh, Dave Goltz, and uh, I think we made four errors or something in the first couple innings and kind of buried ourselves uh, from the beginning. Yes, it is unfortunate that the season ended the way it did. I had gotten the hamstring thing from a book that I was looking at. It's uh, from Gary Parker, Winner Go Home, Sudden Death Baseball. I mentioned the hamstring. Maybe it was something else. If so, I stand corrected. Not a problem. Okay, well, the first game of that series, um, you had trouble swinging because you were having a bandage, uh, a bandage on. You're facing Ken Forsh in that Houston series. Uh, season's on the line. Bottom of the ninth is two to one. Rudy Law is a pinch runner on second. Forsh is giving you breaking balls. At this point in the game, you're over three, and yet you deliver a single to center to tie the game. How was the fourth time different through the order facing him in the lineup? Game's on the line. That's my job, to drive in big runs. And uh, I got a one-two uh, breaking ball, 
that I uh, hit back up the middle to tie the game, and then uh, Joe Ferguson came up in the uh, bottom of the tenth, the next inning to uh, to win the first game of that series. Oh, yes, it was absolutely crazy. As Ferguson, he had uh, the helmet in his hand, his left hand, as he was trying the bases, and he threw his helmet uh, off the third base, and he was running around. I saw you and a lot of other guys congratulating him, and then uh, Lasorda jumped into Ferguson's arms. So that was, I'm sure, a great moment. Uh, it was, but it kept us alive. We had two more games to go. Yes, you didn't get a hit the game after the next game, but... The clutch gene showed once again when he hit a two-run homer in the bottom of the eighth. I think it was off of Frank LaCourt. Um, that also scored Steve Garvey. You guys are down 3-2. to two. And the funny thing is, in that at-bat, this is where um, you would follow the pitch off your ankle. But you try to be a sacrifice man, and yet you would end up hitting that game-running two-run shot um, to make it a tie to end the season. So where were you both physically and emotionally as you were rounding the bases as you hit that home run, that go-ahead home run, to give you guys a tie for first place? Once again, it's it's about putting us ahead. I got a pitch to hit, a uh, three-and-two pitch, and uh, I buried it in the left center field pavilion. So it gave us an opportunity to... Uh, to go ahead, and then uh, I believe Don Sutton came out of the bullpen to pitch the ninth and uh, send us on to a one-game playoff. The funny thing is, though, Ron, is that some people, in big moments, in clutch situations, they don't always perform in sports, but you had quite a few moments, so what do you chalk up to that? I really don't know. I love being in the moment. That's what I was getting paid for, is to... Uh, deliver big hits. Uh, when I retired or left the Dodgers, I uh, uh, was number one on the uh, all-time game-winning hits list, so uh, it stood up over a period of time. Certainly very interesting, and it is unfortunate that Joe Necro, he pitched that complete game 7-1. to one. They gave the Astros the NL West at Dodger Stadium, that tiebreaker, but even though you guys fell short, what do you think could be said about that team, that not only you individually, but also the entire club, to battle through so much adversity during that whole stretch in such a short period of time? Um, you know, it's part of our character. You know, we, we were fortunate to have a lot of success. We were played in a lot of big games. Uh, we won a lot of big games, and we lost some big games. And uh, I, 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 I uh, appreciate the fact that, uh, that you know, we had a club that uh, was one of the premier teams in baseball over a 10-year period, and uh, um, I'm thrilled that we were able to do many, many different things that made it very significant for not only us as individuals, but our organization and our fans. 1981, the magical year. A lot of things to cover here. That was the year of Fernando Mania. How would you describe it as someone who saw Fernando Mania firsthand? Um, you know, it was, uh, I think Walter O'Malley, if he had been alive, it would have been one of his, uh, highlights. Uh, I think he always wanted a, a Hispanic player of significance to be able to take, uh, center stage. And, uh, look, we'd already, we'd already drawn three million people. We were the first team in Major League Baseball to draw three million people. Uh, and when Fernando pitched, I'm sure he brought even a few more people in. But uh, seeing Fernando Mania, much like later on we would see uh, Hideo Nomo and Chan Ho Park um, come from Korea and Japan, and that Mania as well, um, they were all very exciting moments. But center stage, you mean the pitcher's mound, because David Lopes was Hispanic, but he was quite the player himself, as you certainly know. You know well enough about, though. So you just mean like on the pitcher's mound then? Uh, Davy Lopes is Portuguese. Oh, I see. And, and uh, Fernando Valenzuela is from Mexico. So to have a young player of that magnitude really be able to take center straight stage and bring in the people and have Fernando Mania, I don't remember us having Davy Lopes Mania, but certainly Davy was a terrific player and he's a great friend. And he's uh, now teaming up with Dusty Baker in uh, Washington. Um, you know, Fernando Mania was, you know, at that point in time, the first thing we had really seen that uh, had united the uh, Hispanic population 
uh, in numbers that uh, became Fernando Mania. And as we all know, he won both the Rookie of the Year and the Cy Young, quite the season for him. And there was that player strike in 81. Um, you guys were first place in the first half of the season in the NL West, but fourth in the second half. You guys were 27 and 26. So to what extent do you think you guys were affected as a team by the 81 strike? It simply means that we didn't have to win the second half title and that we could get prepared for the playoffs. Excellent. Well, there was an eerily similar script from that year, uh, September 9th. You got an injury because there was a pinch hit, a pitch, excuse me, that uh, hit your left forearm from Tom Griffin of the Giants. You're working very hard. There's a cast that's supposed to be on you for five weeks, so it was only on for three. You were quoted in the New York Times in October story of that year upon returning to the third against the Expos, the NLCS. I'd have to cut my throat if I wasn't, quote, I'll figure if I'll be able to handle the physical, and if I can't, I'll do a positive thinking, end quote. So, that really says a lot to your character, I think, the fact that you were able to do whatever it took to get back to the NLCS against the Expos, assuming, though, that you guys won the DS against the Astros, which you did not play in. That's correct. I uh, needed some help. So regardless of whether I was ready to go or not, uh, we still had to beat the uh, Houston Astros. And they were up two games to nine in that series. They only had to win one more. So considering they only had to win one game at Dodger Stadium, was there a lot of worry on your end that you might not see action for the rest of that season? <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a big task to try to beat uh, anybody three in a row in the playoffs. And, uh, we had them uh, on our turf, and our guys responded and, uh, and uh, won three in a row and uh, sent us against the, uh, the Montreal Expos. And they've won the pennant. Of course, the defining moment, Blue Monday in Montreal, and Rick Monday took Steve Rogers deep at the top of the ninth, and they were down 2-1 to one that series, you guys were. But you guys overcame that as well. And the Yankees, they are up 2 nothing on you guys in the World Series. But how much did it help you guys, knowing that you were down to the Astros 2 nothing and the Expos down 2-1? to one? How much did that factor into you guys turning it around, knowing you guys have been there before in that same spot early in the season, early in the playoffs? I just think we felt like we were the team of destiny. We'd been able to overcome all the adversity, and uh, this was just another one of those things that uh, we had to, uh, to bear down and uh, take care of. Yes, well, Game 3 was a superhuman effort for you. Your three-run homer off of Dave Rigetti, and then there was a diving play in foul territory. Valley Mercer, he bunted one foul, and then you doubled off Larry Milbourne when you made that diving catch from Mercer. So which were you more proud of between that double play and that home run against Rigetti? Uh, both. Uh, they were both. Uh, significant plays that came up that uh, that I was involved in, and uh, uh, we were able to weather the storm. Uh, the Yankees uh, battled us tough the whole whole season, uh, or excuse me, the whole postseason in the in the series. Uh, some tough one run games that we had to win, and uh, so it was uh, it was a battle every single day. Game five, that was when Goose Gosses drilled you in the head. What do you remember feeling upon that moment that you've been drilled? I know that you were one out for the rest of the game, but what do you remember upon that point, uh, the moment that you were hitting the head? I remember falling in slow motion and uh, wanted to know when I had our trainer, Bill Bueller, out there if, uh, if I looked okay from his vantage point. Um, I wasn't bleeding and there wasn't... Uh, Anything that happened other than uh, me having a, a concussion, and under today's rules and regulations, I would have been uh, ruled out of the rest of the series. But um, they were different at that point in time, and it was uh, the decision was left up to me after I was cleared by the uh, uh, people at Cedars, uh, the neurologist, and so on. Uh, I was given the okay to go back to New York, and uh, so uh, ready to go. You guys won games 3, 4, and 5 by one run. Then you won the World Series 9-2 for the clincher in game 6. And you had gone through so much in your career. And the journey you were on to finally win the World Series. What were you most proud of in that moment? 
Uh, the fact that we had spent so many years uh, seeking our goal, and uh, it was also the last game that the uh, infield, the fabled infield, would play together. And uh, for the record, I, uh, the, it is known as the longest running infield in Major League history. I'm not going to tell you that we were the greatest infield of all time because I don't believe it myself. But factually, we were the most successful infield in Major League history. And it was the last game that we would play together. Davey Lopes would be traded to uh, Oakland, and uh, Steve Sachs would take over for Davey the next year. Then who do you think was the greatest infield in history? Uh, you know, I read a recent thing here, and with all these new Sabre metrics things, they listed uh, about ten teams, and we were one of them. And I think that uh, based on... Uh, like I said, a lot of new new statistics, uh, saber metrics, and war. I think they uh, I think they determined by that that the uh, Milwaukee uh, Milwaukee uh, Brewers infield with Robin Yount and uh, and uh, Jimmy Gantner uh, was, uh, and so that's that's I suppose that's debatable as well. Um, personally speaking, I like the. Uh, I like this Yankee infield that they had a few years ago, probably a lot now. Uh, but it was uh, Teixeira, Cano, Cheater, and Rodriguez. Uh, probably the, the highest paid infield of all time, without a question. But uh, that was that was a pretty good infield as well. Certainly was. And winning a World Series is winning a World Series. But did it mean anything more to you the fact that your World Series win came against the Yankees? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, because you have, you know, arguably the two richest uh, traditions in uh, in Major League history, and the Yankees, and of course the Yankees are, you know, number one. Uh, they have won so many more times than anybody else, but uh, a, uh, an argument that could be made in the National League as well by the Cardinals, I suppose. Um, I think they they are number two on the all-time uh, World Series winning list, but with all our other history and tradition, like Jackie Roberts, et cetera, the first 30 home run for us and the, the longest running and most successful infield in Major League history. We've got a lot of things that we can throw out there, too. So uh, we're in the mix, just that our history and tradition for the best. Uh, coming up 28 years, it's been missing because that's the last World Series we played in. So uh, we've got a lot to do to, to improve that, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll find our way back here pretty soon. And where do you see them going? Because... You know, they missed on David Price. They lost Zach Greinke to Arizona. They tried to get Hisashi Iwakuma, but physical pending, they backed out of that. They end up getting Kenta Maeda. The Diamondbacks made moves. The Giants made moves. And the Dodgers have won three straight NL West crowns. Where do you see them going this year? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think the people in the front office can probably answer that question a little better than me. But I was, uh, I was disappointed to lose Zach. Uh, I thought Zach was... Uh, was uh, uh, he and Clay uh, were the best one-two tandem in baseball. Uh, they're both very competitive. They're both good fielders. They're both good hitters. Uh, they both thrive off each other, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to miss Zach. I uh, wish him well, but uh, certainly I'd like to have him on our side. How did the fantasy camp go with the, uh, with the Dodgers and White Sox last week in Arizona? How did that go? Uh, we haven't got a lot of feedback yet, but I think uh, overall, from what I heard, everybody had a terrific time. Uh, we're certainly looking for uh, a bigger camp. Uh, we'll, we'll take and digest uh, uh, the uh, uh, emails for suggestions that the campers have coming back and returning here probably in the next few weeks and uh, see how we uh, uh, tweak things and, and make this camp a, even a better one for the next year. But my overall feeling is that uh, everybody had a terrific time, and uh, we're looking forward to having it again next year. Also, happy early birthday to you, by the way. Uh, two or three weeks coming up is your birthday, uh, February 15th. What do you plan to do to celebrate? <laughs> uh, I'm going to Las Vegas. Yeah, my family talked me into going to Las Vegas, so we're going to go up there and uh, spend the weekend. As you may or may not know, it was actually 34 years ago a day the Cubs got Ryan Sandberg, and you were traded to the Cubs in January of 83. How tough was it for you to leave the organization you spent your entire career playing for at that point? Uh, extremely difficult. Uh, I spent 15 years there, and uh, I had a close relationship with 
the O'Malley family, and uh, Peter and I actually had gone out, and uh, he asked me to lunch. We went and discussed it. He felt it was uh, best for uh, the new group of young players coming in to uh, take our place and move on, and he said he'd be happy to help with anything that uh, to, to, to make this move uh, uh, as easy as possible. And so once we... Uh, uh, understood that, then uh, there were really no roadblocks, just a matter of where I was going to go. Now, with you as a Cub, it was in your later years, so what kind of things were you able to mentor and teach someone like a young son, uh, Ryan Sandberg about? Because um, a veteran presence in the clubhouse is so very important, as emphasized these days especially, so what kind of things were you able to teach uh, a younger player like a Sandberg or someone else uh, serving in that veteran pro, that veteran presence? Uh, well, uh, first of all, Larry Boa had his hands all over Sandberg before I did, so <laughs> that was reasonable to understand. It came from the same organization, the Phillies, and Dallas Green was our general manager, so uh, Dallas had done a nice job of putting this team together in a short period of time. And, but uh, the, the, the simple things for me were, uh, since uh, Ryan was going to go back and play second base, uh, was just you know how I was going to give him feeds on plays inner half of the bag on the outside half of the bag when those circumstances would come up and uh, just have a communication line so he can he can understand where he's going to get the feeds from me from third base so uh, just you know other things you know that, that happened during the course of the game just, just reminders or whatever but he was always a, a, an outstanding defensive player he was always a smart player and, uh, and he had a level head and uh, he was a terrific player when you got to the Cubs, your manager was Lee Ilya, and Tommy Lasorda was known for his feistiness and outspokenness. How would you compare Lasorda against the angry uh, tirade that Lee Ilya had in '83? Uh, real comparable. Uh, you know, on a scale of one to ten, they're they're both up there pretty good. But uh, I liked Lee. Lee was a guy that stood up for his players, and uh, I think I just liked playing for him and. Uh, uh, certainly, he stood up for me when uh, I was going through a rough period, and uh, so yeah, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Lee Ely guy. Well, I know that he was very outspoken against the fans in that tirade. Where did you stand on Cub fans at that point when you were playing at Wrigley? Uh, well, they were a different breed, uh, certainly. Uh, I don't. I, I came from a, a little bit different culture of a fan. Um, you know, our fans always expected us to win, and and I think the Cub fans at that point in time it was. Uh, you know, just uh, uh, that was the thing to do. You go to cup games in the afternoon. Uh, you, it's okay if they win. It would be nice if they won, but it's not going to ruin your day if they don't. And then when 1984 rolled around, then we put together a really terrific team, and uh, uh, we won. And uh, we were able to withstand the run from the New York Mets, and the Mets had guys like Carter and Hernandez and uh, Strawberry and Gooden and Darling and et cetera, Jesse Roscoe, and so they had a, an outstanding team as well. But uh, you know, our, our fans now, once they understood how much fun it was to win, then uh, it changed their uh, changed their attitude a little bit. But uh, I thought they were great fans. Uh, they always had a good time, one way or another. I think it was Keith Hernandez who was runner up to Sandberg in '84, the NL MVP. The year before, you guys were '71 and '91, and then you guys won the NL East in '84. Were you surprised at such a big turnaround and improvement in just one year? Um, not based on the personnel that we had. Um, you know, these guys from Philadelphia came over as winners. Uh, the people that we uh, had in place, Rick Sutcliffe, Rick Sutcliffe pitched with me and. Uh, and, and with the Dodgers, uh, his rookie year, he won 17 games. Uh, Dennis Eckersley, uh, Steve Trout, uh, uh, Dick Ruthven, who came from Philadelphia as well, Scott Sanderson from Montreal. All these guys, you know, have been in the rotation, have been successful careers. Now we had them on our staff in a five-man rotation, and we had a we had a good mix in the bullpen, and we had Lee Smith to close it out. Something I didn't know, and I was reading an article from MLB.com when the four of you infielders were reunited, is that, because David was also on that Cubs team, and from what I read, you actually vouched to Dallas Green to go get Suckler from Cleveland and go get Davey Lopes to bring them onto the Cubs. Actually, he did that with Rick Suckler, too. Uh, he uh, 
got a hold of me and said that he had an opportunity to uh, to get Rick Sutcliffe, I believe, from Cleveland at that point. And uh, I said, I said the guy's a bulldog. He's going to pitch his innings. Uh, uh, he's he's durable. Uh, he's a winner. Uh, if you got an opportunity to get him, then go get him. And he did. And uh, with Davey, Davey's name came up later. <coughs> and I said, you know, this is a terrific acquisition, too, because Davey can pinch run, he can pinch hit, he can play second, he can play third, he can play in the outfield. Uh, uh, he's still in great shape. He's, he's a great clubhouse guy. So uh, he, he, he became a uh, real nice fit for us, too.